Hello. Welcome to the Short Story Workshop. My name is Matt Bowles. I'm joined by Melody Bowles and Simone King. Today we are going to be reading and discussing Mr. and Mrs. Elliot by Ernest Hemingway. I picked this story, so I'm going to tell you a bit about it. It's a lesser known story by Hemingway, one of his earliest, and it has multiple possible interpretations in my opinion. And some of those have perhaps changed over the years. And I think looking at it from a modern perspective kind of changes it a little. And also it's just a very interesting demonstration of his style. He has this very distinctive style where he uses very simple sentences and deliberately doesn't say things. And I think this story is a great demonstration of that. So here we go. Here is Mr. and Mrs. Elliot by Ernest Hemingway. Mr. and Mrs. Elliot tried very hard to have a baby. They tried as often as Mrs. Elliot could stand it. They tried in Boston after they were married and they tried coming over on the boat. They did not try very often on the boat because Mrs. Elliot was quite sick. She was sick and when she was sick, she was sick as southern women are sick. That is, women from the southern part of the United States. Like all southern women, Mrs. Elliot disintegrated very quickly under seasickness, travelling at night and getting up too early in the morning. Many of the people on the boat took her for Elliot's mother. Other people who knew they were married believed she was going to have a baby. In reality, she was 40 years old. Her years had been precipitated suddenly when she started travelling. She had seemed much younger. In fact, she had seemed not to have any age at all when Elliot had married her after several weeks of making love to her after knowing her for a long time in her tea shop before he had kissed her one evening. Hubert Elliot was taking postgraduate work in law at Harvard when he was married. He was a poet with an income of nearly $10,000 a year. He wrote very long poems very rapidly. He was 25 years old and had never gone to bed with a woman until he married Mrs. Elliot. He wanted to keep himself pure so that he could bring to his wife the same purity of mind and body that he expected of her. He called it to himself living straight. He had been in love with various girls before he kissed Mrs. Elliot and had always told them sooner or later that he had led a clean life. Nearly all the girls lost interest in him. He was shocked and really horrified at the way girls would become engaged to and marry men whom they must know had dragged themselves through the gutter. He once tried to warn a girl he knew against a man of whom he had almost proof that he had been a rotter at college and a very unpleasant incident had resulted. Mrs. Elliot's name was Cornelia. She had taught him to call her Calutina, which was her family nickname in the South. His mother cried when he brought Cornelia home after their marriage but brightened very much when she learned that they were going to live abroad. Cornelia had said, you dear sweet boy, and held him closer than ever when he had told her how he had kept himself clean for her. Cornelia was pure too. Kiss me again like that, she said. Hubert explained to her that he had learned that way of kissing from hearing a fellow tell a story once. He was delighted with his experiment and they developed it as far as possible. Sometimes when they had been kissing together a long time, Cornelia would ask him to tell her again that he had kept himself really straight for her. The declaration always set her off again. At first Hubert had no idea of marrying Cornelia. He had never thought of her that way. She had been such a good friend of his, and then one day in the little back room of the shop they had been dancing to the gramophone while her girlfriend was in the front of the shop, and she had looked up into his eyes and he had kissed her. He could never remember just when it was decided that they were to be married, but they were married. They spent the night of the day they were married in a Boston hotel. They were both disappointed, but finally Cornelia went to sleep. Hubert could not sleep and several times went out and walked up and down the corridor of the hotel in his new Jaeger bathrobe that he had bought for his wedding trip. As he walked he saw all the pairs of shoes, small shoes and big shoes, outside the doors of the hotel rooms. This set his heart to pounding and he hurried back to his own room but Cornelia was asleep. He did not like to waken her and soon everything was quite alright and he slept peacefully. The next day they called on his mother and the next day they sailed for Europe. It was possible to try to have a baby, but Cornelia could not attempt it very often, although they wanted a baby more than anything else in the world. They landed at Cherbourg and came to Paris. They tried to have a baby in Paris. Then they decided to go to Dijon, where there was summer school and where a number of people who crossed on the boat with them had gone. They found there was nothing to do in Dijon. Hubert, however, was writing a great number of poems, and Cornelia typed them for him. They are all very long poems. He was very severe about mistakes and would make her redo an entire page if there was one mistake. She cried a good deal and they tried several times to have a baby before they left John. 
They came to Paris, and most of their friends from the boat came back too. They were tired of Dijon, and anyway, would now be able to say that after leaving Harvard or Columbia or Wabash, they had studied at the University of Dijon down in the Côte d'Or. Many of them would prefer to go to Languedoc, Montpellier or Perpignan if there are universities there. But all those places are too far away. Dijon is only four and a half hours from Paris and there is a diner on the train. So they all sat around the Café du Dom, avoiding the rotonde across the street because it was always so full of foreigners, for a few days and then the Elliots rented a chateau in Touraine through an advertisement in the New York Herald. Elliot had a number of friends by now, all of whom admired his poetry, and Mrs. Elliot had prevailed upon him to send over to Boston for her girlfriend, who had been in the tea shop. Mrs. Elliot became much brighter after her girlfriend came, and they had many good cries together. The girlfriend was several years older than Cornelia and called her Honey. She too came from a very old southern family. The three of them, with several of Elliot's friends who called him Hubie, went down to the chateau in Touraine. They found Touraine to be a very flat, hot country, very much like Kansas. Elliot had nearly enough poems for a book now. He was going to bring it out in Boston and already sent his cheque to, and made a contract with, a publisher. In a short time, the friends began to drift back to Paris. Touraine had not turned out the way it looked when it started. Soon all the friends had gone off with a rich, young and unmarried poet to a seaside resort near Trouville. There they were all very happy. Elliot kept on at the chateau in Touraine because he had taken it for all summer. He and Mrs. Elliot tried very hard to have a baby in the big hot bedroom on the big hard bed. Mrs. Elliot was learning the touch system on the typewriter, but she found that while it increased the speed, it made more mistakes. The girlfriend was now typing practically all of the manuscripts. She was very neat and efficient and seemed to enjoy it. Elliot had taken to drinking white wine and lived apart in his own room. He wrote a great deal of poetry during the night and in the morning looked very exhausted. Mrs. Elliot and the girlfriend now slept together in the big medieval bed. They had many a good cry together. In the evening, they all sat at dinner together in the garden under a plane tree. An hot evening wind blew, and Elliot drank white wine, and Mrs. Elliot and the girlfriend made conversation, and they were all quite happy. All right, so before we talk anymore, I want to mention the fact that this story is reportedly based on someone that Hemingway knew and he changed the name, or some people think it's about T.S. Eliot and who've, who definitely had a very similarly poor love life, which is, is kind of interesting in its own way, but we're, I think I want to ignore that because it makes the story less ambiguous and kind of less interesting to me. Just be like, oh, it's about T.S. Eliot, and it kind of answers all the questions. So I just want to look at the story on its own. Sounds good. Ignore that part and see what we think. Is that okay with you guys? That makes sense. Sat satire of people he knows is so much less interesting than the story itself. Yeah, I mean, I know usually we look at the historical context and we kind of use that to inform our view of the story. Oh, I just want to do the opposite this time. Yeah. So, um, what were your first impressions when you read this? I really liked it. Hemingway is hilarious. I like his subtle roasts. He's just so scathing. It's funny how much did I miss the first time. I I do like the line where he's like he wrote very long poems very rapidly. And the, the first time through, I just took that at face value. And the second time, I was like, hang on a minute. Is he saying that these poems are just not very good? <laughs> yeah. And he's also got that. They all sat around the Café du Dom, avoiding the rotund across the street because it was always so full of foreigners. They are foreigners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, his characters don't have a very good time in this story. Are they having a bad time? They're travelling like Paris and stuff writing and drinking wine like yeah but it ends with they were all very happy and i just don't believe it it sounds like they were having a bad time so they called mrs elliot's girlfriend and then mr elliot got really drunk the end <laughs> see i i see where you're coming from and that's probably the more conventional interpretation of the story but i like the interpretation that they are actually happy really? and that even though they've like almost stumbled into this marriage and they've had moments where they didn't know what was going on 
they've not been able to have a baby. He's managed to get his wife's girlfriend to stay with them, and she seems happier now. She's much better at doing the typing, so that's cool. He's able to write, which he seems to like doing. And I like, I kind of like to think that in some weird way, things ended up almost working out for them. I would agree. I actually really prefer the optimistic view of this story of a slightly more unconventional relationship that challenges a lot of the stereotypes that it sets up at the beginning for you optimistically with the idea that actually, no, he hasn't failed by not making his wife pregnant and like by wanting to do things in a slightly different way that actually can be happy without those conventions in their own unusual polyamorous or whatever that dynamic is set up like it's a nicer idea i think than the idea that he's just drinking himself into depression so i've maybe taken an old-fashioned view on this story i think you'd take a popular view on the story because i think a lot of i read some of the critics um commentary after forming my own opinions out of curiosity and a lot of people think with the ending that it means that he's gone to a toxic form of masculinity aka heavy drinking as a way of coping with his failures in other areas of life or particularly masculinity and i just i don't like that idea but it is a popular one yeah the whole thing with them having a baby trying to have a baby doesn't really get resolved like it doesn't explain if they're still trying or if they just gave up (laughs) does it say if they even really wanted a baby i think it did it does but i'm not convinced (laughs) i mean there's quite an age gap between them as well like she's 40 isn't she and he's like 25 and it mentions a couple of times that she tried really hard but she just couldn't she just couldn't try that day for whatever reason and i'm like i don't know (laughs) i mean as an asexual person i just said it it's like maybe they just don't like sex that much given both of their backgrounds but another thing i was thinking of was that maybe they're both gay and i don't know that too just a stab in the dark (laughs) see i think that's one of the things that has changed i think if you look at this in modern eyes you're like oh his wife's gay but at the time probably that was just been like oh he's failed at doing the husband's duty or whatever and they've had to get a girl in i feel like that's the angle that they were it was written from Kind of just shows how the way we look at it has changed. Yeah, did they refer to people as girlfriend back in the day? I don't know. They could so easily avoid that connotation just by giving her a name. Yeah, she is never named, it's true. Um, And it's interesting because I think she's. it says she's older than Mrs Elliot, who's 40, so they have quite a strange generational mix going on. Well, I say strange, maybe I mean unconventional. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that's the real strength of the story, as it is. They do end up in this really unconventional situation, and I feel like that's kind of the point. Nothing in the story really goes as planned, and yet they still end up in a reasonably happy place. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't complain about living in a resort in Paris that I could afford to, like, you know, write and drink wine in the evenings and have nice meals. Like, honestly, that just sounds great. But it says that um, Mrs. Elliot and the girlfriend had a good cry together. What does, yeah. does that mean? Like a literally good cry? I don't know what it means. Hmm. <laughs> I did wonder. It's a bit of a dubious verbiage there, Is that isn't it? An innuendo. <laughs> I mean, if it's an innuendo, it went over my head. I just assumed they were actually crying, and it was quite cathartic. But you could interpret it either way. I definitely thought it was an innuendo. <laughs> they do mention it more than once, don't they? Yeah. I, I like to imagine it from Mr. Elliot's point of view, and he's just like, "Are you sure are crying loudly this evening? What's up with that?" <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Mrs. Elliot does just cry a lot throughout the entire story. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could see it either way. I think. Yeah, I don't know if I think she's happy. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's better when the girlfriend is there, though. Mm, I don't think crying necessarily means you're unhappy. I say this as someone who's cried at adverts before. Oh, like, movies all the time. Like, I think it can just be a cathartic way of dealing with emotions, and it doesn't necessarily indicate a deeper sadness. Some people just cry really easily. I I definitely cry at movies and games, but usually it is because I feel sad. I guess I used to happy cry more when I was younger, but I don't really... I haven't really done that for ages. Maybe you're more self-intuitive. 
to know when you're crying because you're sad rather than just randomly crying at something and realizing 10 years later oh i was a sad and oh angry crying i do oh, that God, angry <laughs> crying is the worst people immediately dismiss <laughs> your anger and it's like take me seriously damn it uh women just have far too much estrogen it's terrible yeah terrible okay so should we move on do we all agree that they're gay i definitely read it that way <laughs> yeah I could accept that maybe his wife is bisexual. I could accept that, actually. Or pansexual. There are times when she does seem to show interest in Mr. Elliot. I mean, yeah, they do try for a baby quite a lot, so I assume she's not completely repulsed by him. Okay. <laughs> so, like a lot of Hemingway's work, he's delving into the topic of masculinity a little bit here. Well, a lot, really. I think that's maybe what he was thinking about when he wrote the story, and if we don't really look at it that way now right mm. what does this story say about masculine masculinity then because i didn't pick up on anything like that so you know it's unusual to see a male character so hooked on or so caught up on his own need to be pure and virginal between um before marriage essentially because that's normally something that's expected of women but it's very often not something expected of men and it's something that he's criticized by the other characters Throughout the story, for example, there's the implication that as soon as the girlfriends of Mr. Elliot's past realised he was still a virgin, they were immediately uninterested in him compared to, say, men who had a lot of sex and were very aggressively masculine. He's kind of got a bit of a complex about it, doesn't he? Like, he tried to warn one of his friends off and it turned nasty because she tried, well, I guess, tried to tell her that, oh, this guy's slept with lots of people, you deserve better. Hashtag, I'm a nice guy. I did wonder about why he seemed to care so much about that. He mentions he's pure and he's been living straight. And I was just a bit like, okay. It is a bit of a strange notion. It is, but it's also something that if it was coming from a woman character or protagonist of that time period, you probably wouldn't blink at because it would have been expected. Yes. I think also the fact that they seem unable to have a baby is just like a metaphor for his failure to be masculine. I see. Also, apparently he can't get a woman his own age. And like, there are hints like that. Yeah, that's a good point. So I, I suppose if you take the, the pessimistic interpretation, what's actually being said in this story is men should be masculine, and if they're not, they will be unhappy. Yeah. Which I think probably, probably fits Hemingway's worldview. So masculine is sleeping with lots of women, getting them pregnant, and not writing lots of poetry <laughs> poetry can be masculine um it's not that i don't think because there were lots of i mean hemingway was a writer he probably knew lots of poets and probably most of them were male yeah like you just didn't get as many female writers well you did they just weren't you know probably within the accepted clique i mean you had gertrude stein but she if i remember correctly she didn't present like as a typical feminine figure i guess i'm using my more modern taken that i'm sure at school it was all the girls who were into poetry and the boys were just not interested yeah but you weren't like in a group of artists were you no i wondered if he was almost saying it too much it felt a bit defensive <laughs> um he also says that so at first i thought he meant he wasn't going to have sex before marriage and then i realized it said that he'd been sleeping with her before they got married so i was like i don't know what this means i guess it's until you find the one very christian he just doesn't stick to his belief he says one thing and does something else is how i interpreted that okay but also if the one person he has sex with is the woman he marries so you would say that mr elliot is not a very masculine guy by the standards of ernest hemingway oh Absolutely yeah definitely not. understatement of the century okay got it i mean he Cornelia literally calls him, you dear sweet boy. It's not like, oh, you handsome man. Like, it's, it's not like he's sweeping her off his feet. <laughs> also, um, the bit where it's just like, they spent the night of the day. They were married in Boston Hotel. They were both disappointed, but finally, finally Cornelia went to sleep. Wow. <laughs> it's not a rave review, is it? Yeah, like you don't really want to be disappointed on your honeymoon, do you? Not really, no. It's a tough time. I feel sorry for them. 
I do like the, that he just goes outside and starts looking at everyone's shoes. How random is that? I mean, what else do you do in that situation? It's such a sombre moment. I'm like, how did you even come up with this? It's so weirdly specific. And then he comes back in and she's asleep and he's like, well, I guess I'm stuck here now. It's just this weirdly <laughs> human moment. It is, yeah. <laughs> I was quite struck by it. I thought it was quite sad, particularly if you think about what shoes represent, like the idea of leaving and you take your shoes off when you go into someone's house and yes. all that kind of thing. It's like, okay, stuck with this now. So the ma- main character, Mr. Elliot, is a poet, poet here. He specifically writes long poems. Very quickly. <laughs> Very badly. <laughs> and he got them sent to a publisher, didn't he? But isn't it implied that he paid the publisher off? It was like, uh, what's it called? A vanity press? Yeah. He'd already sent his check to. Yeah, seems a bit dodgy. And made a contract with a publisher. Doesn't seem right. Um, So I find it really interesting that within the depiction of him being an author, um, Hemingway made a point to call out to the fact that he wasn't actually doing any of his own typing. And he was getting Cornelia to do a lot of the um, background typing for her for him and then was getting very annoyed when she did it wrong she cries doesn't she yeah like he's harsh enough to make his wife cry because she made a like mistake in typing up his work and it just kind of seemed like an interesting thing to include within the story particularly as i came across an article recently on based on a twitter thread called um hashtag thanks for typing talked about how throughout history a lot of male authors both fiction and in like academic scholarly writing had ended up using their wives to type up their manuscripts sometimes it was just typing other times it was like a kind of quiet editing and fixing of mistakes and it just kind of made me think about how much of our author's authorship history has this kind of unpaid unspoken about labor behind it i found it interesting that hemingway included that i would argue that it's not it's more than just writing right like a lot of Scientists back in the day had all their calculations done by women. Yes, like Einstein's wife um, did a lot of work for his. Yeah. Like it's just a massive theme, I guess, for anything once you start talking about writing is, okay, who's backing the writer? There's an literal way of typing. But then um, I remember someone talking about a writer's conference they went to about how any writer at, in the contemporary age or before who can afford to write full time has a partner who's supporting them. Like, statistically, most writers nowadays will make less than £5,000 a year. But a lot of people don't talk about this, which leads to a lot of demotivation in aspiring or new writers or young writers from people who have a full-time job and have to juggle jobs with writing or even childcare and feel like they can't do it all. And it's because it's not made to be a system where you can do it all. We just don't talk about it. There's always that big, big page in the back of books where authors thank all the people who help them, isn't there? Yeah, acknowledgement. I love reading those. I don't know why. They often mention wives, friends, partners, family members, as well as editors and professional people they work with at the publishing house. Um, Quite a lot of... Some of them go on for about two or three pages to cover everybody who helped with the book, and it's yeah pretty amazing <laughs> because you only see what you only see that one name on the front. Yeah, exactly. We seem to be under the impression that a lot of writing it's just this one person who wrote this book, and it's just not true at all, really. But to loop back to Hemingway, yeah, it was interesting that he included it, and it made me kind of think about their relationship because they say they're happy. But, like, how can you be happy in a relationship with someone who's screaming at you for doing them a favour? Like, why doesn't he just type off his own things if it's just that annoying to him? Didn't endear me to the character. I So, Ernest Hemingway didn't have anyone doing his typing for him then? No, I believe. I remember reading stories about his typewriter. He would type things up himself and, like, use it as an opportunity to fix things. So, what do you think it says about the character that he specifies... He doesn't even type his own poetry. The thing (laughs) is, it was so, like, widely done. Yeah, I think it was a jab at his contemporaries, honestly. Yeah, like, you either do it yourself or you don't. Well, I enjoy that. I do feel for Mrs. Elliot, but it's okay, because in the end, her girlfriend comes and she's good at the typing. Yeah, and I mean, if she enjoys it, then more power to her. I like that that one passage about the typing says so much about what's going on. Yeah. It's the act of creation again, isn't it? Like, they're failing to try for a baby, which is an act of creation. 
And then they're kind of half working together on this poetry thing that he ends up getting all the credit for. Um, she's doing a lot of the manual labour for her and I don't know, there's a lot you could unpick with that, isn't there? Yeah, thank you for saying that because I was thinking earlier but couldn't quite put into words. I was like, why do I feel like there's some sort of link before between this manuscript that he's trying to do and the fact that they're trying for a baby? I don't understand my brain but I think you've unpicked it pretty well. It's the creation. Which also makes it even more gay that the girl was now typing practically all the manuscripts. But anyway. I know. I know. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but once she starts typing the manuscripts, it's fine. Yeah, there's no longer any errors in them. Now it's working. And Elliot has taken to drinking white wine and lived apart. That's why I feel sad for him. Like, his wife's got the girlfriend, but he's just... I guess if you like white wine, it's okay. Maybe you shouldn't have screamed at his wife then. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> marry the 40-year-old woman when he was 25 and can't say why he married her. Clearly, clearly married life is not for him. I don't think that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you do have a pressure to marry and then you're in it, it's like, okay, this is the one thing everyone told me that I have to do. What now? Mm. It's like yeah. so many novels and romances, they talk about getting together. They don't talk about the relationship. The hard bit. Mm. I think some people just aren't built for it and that should be, that's okay. Yeah, as long as it's well communicated and you're not, I guess, pressured into being in a relationship when you're not suited for it because that's unfair to the other person as well. Yeah. So, yeah. All for the unconventional relationship dynamics in this. So, yeah, I like Hemingway's way of saying things in a very simple way and not necessarily going into the emotions but giving you enough that, as a reader, you can interpret quite a lot from what he says. Yes, and sometimes he just says the exact opposite of what he means. He does, but you can kind of almost tell when he's doing that. Yeah, he's quite smart. And I love that one part. She had seemed not to have any age at all when Elliot had married her after several weeks of making love to her after knowing her for a long time in a tea shop before he had kissed her one evening. Isn't that just a great passage? It summarises a romance in a very short space of time. And it's done in such a roundabout way that you really get this sense of being kind of swept up in it, just like Mr. Elliot was. Or sort of meandering into it. Like, I don't get the impression he was swept up his feet. I get the impression it just sort of happened. And he was like, oh, may as well go along with this. Yeah, it seems like it happened before he really had a chance to think about it. Yeah. Um, I'm not really a fan of this style. It's feels like I'm reading a grocery list or it feels like the narrator is not that interested in what's going on <laughs> yeah it's got this kind of detached feeling to it and that's true yeah. I mean it does but it's also incredibly scathing maybe that's what I don't like about it I don't know I'm like if, if you don't care if you don't care why should I care <laughs> but it's actually somewhere in the middle isn't it it's like the writer's like trying to play it off it it does have that feeling of masculinity in it where he's like i'm not really interested but you can tell that he actually is yeah I like see. we pretend we don't have emotions but we do yeah that's the feeling i get from it i mean there is a tension there isn't there with like emotions under the surface but not said like conflict in a novel is primarily because there's something there and there's a conflict to it in hemingway the writing itself poses the conflict because we know there's a lot going on behind them trying for a baby. Like, that's an inherently emotional situation to be in. But he never actually lets us in, which causes a conflict. Yeah. I did feel like, is this a story or is this just a list of facts? <laughs> Obviously, I know it's not all facts, but... It does pro progress chronologically. It does. But he very much tells emotions rather than shows them, which I think a lot of contemporary writers myself included would never do or at least would normally give advice against but i think the key part of his style is that he tells he does tell the emotions but it's more in what he doesn't tell you mm. and that's the key of his he calls it the theory of omission or iceberg theory yeah it's anti-showing there was an example i can't remember which story it was but this man was having a conversation with his wife while cleaning his shotgun. And it's quite a tense conversation. I mean, he's, it's not threatening. It's just um, his wife's not happy about something. And um, 
he he's cleaning the shotgun and he says, oh, he loved his shotgun very much. And you're just sitting there like, what about his wife? Cal, <laughs> he loves his gun more than his wife. It's in the things that he doesn't say. I think that's a good example of it. And I think that's quite smart. So in a way, he is he is showing, even though he's telling. He's just showing something different from what he's telling. I, was, I think I said anti-showing, which I just coined and quite like. It's like, you know, when you make silhouettes to show your photo, like you draw the picture out of the spaces you leave rather than me. Yeah, it's negative space. Which I've always find fascinating in literature and literature of history as well, because I think the negative spaces we leave in our literary canon say a lot. And I think the key part that he does is he doesn't just leave things out. It's like this weird balancing act where you have to draw attention to the things you're not saying. Yeah, because if you just have a massive like gap, then no one's going to pick up on anything other than a massive gap. But if you pinpoint, oh, there's an edge here and an edge here, you can start to make up the shape. Yeah. I use the Hemingway text editor to help me edit my own work. Um, and that kind of, I guess, was, well, I, I assume it's named after Ernest Hemingway um, to try and simplify your prose and make it a bit easier to read. And it concentrates on things like cutting out adverbs. Having now read Ernest Hemingway, I'm not sure I want my writing to sound like his. <laughs> I mean, it's about getting a balance, isn't it? Like... Yeah, I think... In terms of personal preference, his is almost too plain for me. Yeah, no, he's not my favourite of the writers. Like, I appreciate what he's doing, but I also wouldn't want to read, like, an entire series. Like, I can only read Hemingway in short bursts. Yeah, that's fair. I, I He really idolised the simplicity in the words, and I like that part, but some things about it do seem strange. Like, he really hates pronouns. I, I don't know why, I mean... That part doesn't quite work with me. Sometimes you just want to say it or that. I just put my most um, recent bit of writing to Hemingway out of curiosity and I got as a grade three with a lot of things being um, very hard to read, but at the same time, or like, something this is a passive voice, but then it also becomes a styling, doesn't it, after a certain point? Like some things just don't sound as good if you never have adverbs or a more complex sentence. Yeah, sometimes you need contrast and variety more than just have it all in one sort of plain style. That's what I think is weird to me, like the rhythm is weird because it doesn't it doesn't mix as well like a variety of different ways to write things. I did think his I think I did get used to his style after I've read a few stories. I stopped noticing it as much and then I felt better about it, but the first few I read I was I did know it has this weird like staccato rhythm to it it doesn't quite seem right it's lots of stopping and starting right because all the short sentences yeah it doesn't sound like a it doesn't sound like other writing i was gonna say it doesn't sound like a person and then i was like well does any writing sound like a person <laughs> <laughs> i think some of it actually does but that's a different matter like he has some long sentences but a lot of them are very short or simple you'd expect simple ideas to get the message through very simple and simply and cleanly as well but he doesn't always do that which i think is another interesting contrast and i think why his works while most people would get mocked what they'd get mocked like you know a lot of people who if they try and do hemingway without actually understanding what hemingway is doing you end up with a lot of unvaried sentence structure and a very simplistic story because you're not doing the undercurrents that hemingway does like for example he says things in a very simple way but because he's saying simple what he's saying is often contrasting with what he actually means or the implications that stops it being simple. Yeah. Which is why it works, as opposed to if everything in the Hemingway story was taken at face value, it would be terrible writing. It works because if you don't take it at face value... You have to look for the gaps. Mm. Yeah, knowing knowing that, it, it, the, as a style, it makes more sense to me. Like, if I think if I saw a lot of people writing his style, I'd be bored. And I think it requires more effort on the part of the reader to interpret. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why I think it's perhaps better suited to short stories. He did write mostly shorter work, which kind of, it makes sense to me. Did he write any novels? Yeah. Yes. I know I've read some of them. Which ones have I read? Um, 
I've read The Old Man in the Sea, which I think is technically a novel, but it's quite short. The Sun Also Rises is the one I've read, and The Movable Feast, which is his autobiography. Did you enjoy them? Weirdly, I can't really remember them. Okay. <laughs> Fair like, enough. I, like, I remember that his writing style was interesting, and I remember he talked about bullfighting. I had to study it, I think, as part of my degree. Like, I remember thinking, oh, I don't really get the hype around Ernest Hemingway. This hasn't got me obsessed or anything. But, like, having studied it, I could see, appreciate what he was doing. It's just not my go-to. It's interesting contrasting him with Fitzgerald, because they were around at the same time, but they've got such different ways of writing. Strange that they knew each other. I wonder if they liked each other's work or not. But yeah, even his novels were like less than 200 pages. I mean, nice when you want something shorter to read, I guess. Yeah. So, let's talk about Hemingway as a person and his weird and wonderful life. There's so many weird things that happen to this guy that seem so impossible. There's no way we can get through everything. Some insights into his childhood. His mother dressed him as a girl for several years until he was five. No wonder he's got such an obsession with gender. Yeah, kind of makes sense that he then becomes one of the manliest men of all. Why did she do that? I don't really know. I think she wanted another daughter. I, she wanted matching daughters. Okay, very strange. She's a strange lady. But... uh yeah, he was dressed as a girl, but then at the age of three, he went hunting and he killed and ate a porcupine. So, <laughs> clearly he didn't take to his feminine ways. <laughs> I think a porcupine would be quite painful to eat, wouldn't it? I assume he, like, took the spines off. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine him snapping the spines off and crunching on them. <laughs> oh, no. Sorry, I'll stop. He did like hunting. On his 12th birthday, his grandfather gave him a brilliant present. He said... Oh, hello, grandchild. You're 12. Have a shotgun. <laughs> uh, um, doesn't seem sensible, but there we are. I mean, he had a complicated life. He was um, an ambulance driver in World War One, wasn't he? And a journalist in the Spanish Civil War. That's right. Yeah, he, uh, he saw some action. He threw some grenades. He did many action-y things. He must completely screw you over, though. Yeah, I mean... He would, like, go hunting and just throw grenades at turtles while in his boat. And he'd be like, oh, I'm practicing in case I see a Nazi U-boat and I can just grenade it. What does the turtle do, though? I mean, it's not a very nice thing to do, but he's, he's just he just did these really strange things. Uh, he really hated the Nazis, clearly. If you're going to hate anyone, hating the Nazis is probably all right. Well, on a more fun note, Let's play a game. Guess how many cats Hemingway had between his two homes. How many cats did he have at one time? 57. Simone? Um, I was going to go for a normal number, but the fact that this is a game is making me think it's going to be something ridiculous. Then you can't, how, how do you afford 200 cats? So, um, I don't know, um, 20. 20? Is that not a sufficient number of cats? No, no. Uh, the answer is 150. What? Oh, she's stuck with 200. He had this weird obsession with cats that had six toes. What? I don't know why. I One day a sailor said, here, have a cat, or some weird story like that. And it, the cat had six toes. And then he was like, this is really cool. My cat has six toes. And he just collected them. <laughs> okay. And he, he said, one cat leads to another, as if there was nothing he could do about it. Apparently the um, extras meant that they had better abilities as mouses and provided be better balance on rough seas, so they were often used on ships, um, and they were believed to bring good luck. There you go. They're, they're called Hemingway cats now. Oh, that's so cute. Well, <laughs> now I feel a new affinity for him if he likes cats. He loved cats. He would love the internet now where he could just watch as many cat videos as he wanted. He'd be so happy. He'd never get anything done. He'd probably be a YouTuber with his own cat videos. He would. If he had 150, that's loads. That's such good material. <laughs> I would love to see Ernest Hemingway talk about cats on YouTube. Ah, oh, that'd be the life. If we ever invent a time machine, this has to happen. <laughs> yeah, I would. He would. Yeah, I think he'd be really good at it. He could talk about cats in his really simple way, and people would love it. I love cats. I have 150 cats. 
I'd watch it. The cats are a metaphor for human intimacy, which I lack. <laughs> <laughs> this Hemingway fact has made my whole day so much better. I mean, there's so many weird stuff. Apparently, once he was in Paris, he was in the bathroom. He pulled what he thought was the chain for the toilet, pulled a skylight down on his head. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, I am impressed. I like to imagine he pulled that thing really hard. <laughs> I don't know what happened. He's cursed. He had, a, he had a scar on his forehead for the rest of his life, and okay. he was reluctant to tell anyone what happened. <laughs> it's because they're horrible like me and just burst out laughing. Do you think it's because they'd assume it was something really badass, not just that he pulled a skylight on his head? <laughs> like, it's so many weird things. I, I love... We don't have time to do the whole thing, but I love the story about how he ended up reading his own obituaries. I would do that. I'd be really curious what people wanted to say about me after I was dead. Basically, everyone thought he was dead. He was not dead. He was alive. And he was reading all the obituaries, and he had a great time. He loved it. I would absolutely do that. How can you not? It's like your one chance to hear people's unfettered opinions of you. Or either that, or listen to them tell you how brilliant they think you are, regardless of how much they hated you in real life, because you're dead and you have to be nice to dead people. You better tell me if you're going to do that, so I don't fulfil your dying wish and delete all your emails. <laughs> I'd make sure to save the good ones for them. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, I just love this image of Hemingway sitting in a hospital and just turning to the back of the newspapers and reading like, Ernest Hemingway has passed away and he's just laughing his ass off. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if he could have gone to his own funeral. Yeah, he would have loved it. Anyway, if you do want to know the story of how everyone thought he was dead, look it up because it's stupid. Maybe we'll cover it on a future episode. I don't want to do the whole thing because I can't do it justice in five minutes, but it's, uh, it's a wild ride. Sounds like a banger. I think I'll look it up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. That's it for this week. You can find all our stories and our previous episodes on our website at shortstoryworkshop.com. If you would like to contact us, you can do so via Twitter. I am at Matt D. Reiter. Mel. I'm at Fickaholic. And Simone. Uh, T underscore M underscore typewriter, also known as the modern typewriter. Perfect. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back with another story next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.